What does it take to grow? A lot of help. It's not just planting, or rain, or sun, or care. It's all of it. That's how a seed becomes a tree. That's how a bud becomes a flower. That's how a Christian becomes like Christ. What does it look like to naturally follow Jesus, to be an organic disciple? What does it look like when it becomes so much a part of your life that it's just like breathing? It's who you are. My prayer is that these next eight weeks will not just be an adventure for eight weeks of of discovering what it means to naturally follow Jesus, to be an organic disciple. My prayer is that it'll become so much a part of our lives over these eight weeks that it just propels us into the rest of our life. And that we live with Jesus and for Jesus in fresh new ways. I want to welcome you to Organic Disciples, an eight-week journey in growing in Jesus and going with Jesus. Here's the two things that, that God wants to do in you. He wants you to grow in Jesus, to become more like Jesus. So growing in Jesus, but also going with Jesus. Both of those things happen in the life of a natural disciple, of somebody who's following Jesus. You're becoming more and more like Jesus. You're in his footsteps. You're following his ways. That's what a disciple is, is a follower. So you're becoming more like Jesus. But when you become more like Jesus, you actually go more with Jesus into the world, sharing his love. Why? Because that's where Jesus is going. He's always the good shepherd looking for the one lost sheep. Always. So when we walk with him, we're becoming more like him. Becoming like him, we go with him and share his love and his grace. There's something important about growing up about maturing. And if somebody's stuck, we can notice, especially with little kids. If you have a little baby who is not learning to walk and they're past the walking time, parents are concerned. If you have, if, if, if you have a, a toddler who's not talking, parents are concerned because there's, there's certain growth things that are supposed to be happening. Teenagers, if a teenager gets kind of stuck and stalled emotionally, man, people are concerned. They want to get help so they can get moving. Well, what about spiritually? You know, we need to be growing spiritually. Uh, Sherry had a chance, at, over the, between Christmas and New Year's, I had a chance to go down to Orange County and be with some of my family, two of my siblings and a bunch of my nieces and nephews. And Sherry had a chance to go to Michigan and be with our two sons and their wives and our grandkids. And also our parents lived there. And so we kind of parted ways for a little bit, came back together again. But while she was there, she had a great time with the family. She came back and she told me a story about growth. An exciting story. And it, was, it seems like a small thing, but she was telling me, she said, you know, one, one day she had a chance to, to babysit uh, Cohen and Piper. That's our grandson and our granddaughter. Uh, because Bryn, their mom, was going to go get her hair cut. And it's hard to do when you've got lots of little kids. So Sherry said, I'll take the kids. You just go get a haircut. So Piper, who's like one and change, she's just through a little. She came up to Sherry after a little bit. And she says, Mom, Mom. And she realized her mom was gone. And she's, Mom. So Sherry was trying to, you know, Sherry said, oh, oh, Piper, your mom is gone getting a haircut. Not that she understands the whole concept, but she's, she's gone getting a haircut. And that kind of satisfied Piper for a little bit. But then Piper came back a little bit later. And she said, Mom, Mom. She goes, she's gone. She goes, Mom. And Sherry said, well, she's, she's getting a haircut. Well, a short time later, Cohen walked in the room. He wasn't there when this was going on. Cohen came in. And, he, and he's a little bit older. He's three and changed. So he, he, goes, he goes, oh, where's, where's my mom? And Piper goes, hair. <laughs> and, and Sherry was like, she, why would she share that story with me? Because she knew I would delight. I go, oh, she put it together. You know, she put it all together. She's a little kiddo, and she's getting, you know, she's growing. Do you know that with every step you take, becoming more like Jesus, even the little ones, he goes, that's my boy. That's my girl. He delights when we're growing up. And I think God's concerned when we're stalled, when we're not growing spiritually, when we're not becoming more natural in our discipleship, more organic disciples. And so God delights in our growth. I want to read from Ephesians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 4. If you have your Bible app, and if you're at home, if you have your Bible, go to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. In this passage, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is explaining that God gives leaders in the church to help people in the church grow up in faith, to mature in faith, to become more like Jesus. But it's interesting, the language is so strong and so beautiful. It says, okay, so leaders are supposed to invest in people so that they'll grow up in faith until, verse 13, 
until we all reach unity in the faith. When we're growing in faith, we become unified. Unity in faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, we grow in our knowledge of Jesus and become, what's the next word? Mature, spiritually mature. Now listen to this. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the kind of maturity he's talking about. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ matured in you. I don't know if you're there yet, but I'm not. I've been a pastor for, I count it now, and not in weeks or months or years, but in decades. And I'm, I have not achieved the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ yet. There's still room for me to grow. How about you? Can I get an amen if there's some room for you to grow? Okay, that's, that's, that's our journey, right? So we're naturally growing. And that, that's, that's the vision of the heart of God for you and for me. And so over the ne- next eight weeks, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to do something. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you come to the cross, whether you became a follower a week or two ago or whether you became a follower 60 years, 60 years ago, will you say to God, God, I want to grow in my faith. I want to take next steps of maturity. I want to become more and more and more like Jesus. And we're going to give you some ways to do that, some practical ways. I'm going to encourage you in this next eight weeks to jump in with both feet, to absolutely jump in for the next eight weeks and see if it doesn't change you now and for the rest of your life and ultimately change the world because we're transformed by Jesus. Here's my encouragement. Number one, read the book that we wrote, that Sherry and I wrote about organic disciples. If you want to get a copy, if you're online, come in during the week. You can either buy a copy or we'll give you a copy. We have a, if you're on campus, go to the Connection Center and pick up a coffee. If you can afford it, pay for it. If you can't afford it, just take one. And if you can afford to pay for a couple extras, pay for a couple extras so then people who take one, it's covered. We've done this with any book we use here at Shoreline, and we always have enough. It always works out. That's how the church works. We care for each other. But I want to encourage you to get that book and follow along and read with us. Second, I want to challenge you to try getting into a small group. It's not too late. The, the group that Sherry and I are leading, I think we have seven couples in our group. It starts tonight. But there'll be groups starting all week long. And if we need to get more leaders, or if, we need to assign our, if some of our pastors need to lead two or three groups, we'll do that to make sure there's room for everybody. If you say, I want to be in a small group, today you can go out to the courtyard after the service and sign up, and Ashley will work with you, and we'll make sure before the week is done, you have a small group you can be a part of. We'll do all we can to make that happen. But you'll get a chance to study, to think, to talk with others, to pray together, and to grow spiritually. And if you're part of a small group, commit to being there over the next eight weeks. Also, do personal study of the scriptures. We provide a daily reading guide, seven readings a week, out of the Bible for you to get you ready for the next Sunday sermon. So if you go on our website and you go to the reading guide, all you have to do is click on it, and it gives you seven days of reading. And if, you're, if you like listening more than reading, you can actually click on the link. It's a live link. Click on the little microphone on the side, and your computer or your phone will read the passage to you. We just want you to be in the scriptures, getting ready for each week of this series. Take it seriously. Do the self-assessment on our website. You can click on, on the front page. There's a place that says self, self-assessment. Click on that, and there's 35 questions it'll ask you. And each one you just say, you just answer by hitting one of the five little bubbles. That's you know, never true of me, always true of me, or somewhere in between. Click. And when you're done, about two seconds later, all the feedback will come right back to you, to whatever email address you put in, and it'll show you how you're doing in each area of spiritual growth that we're going to talk about in the next eight weeks. And if you click on the box that, box that says, I'd like to meet with someone, we will set up a leader in the church to meet with you one-on-one, and help you design a personal spiritual, <coughs> a personal spiritual growth pathway. What will help? You? Because it's not the same for all of us. All of us have different areas we need to be growing. So we will actually meet with you and walk with you. We'll do all we can to help you grow. You do your part to jump in and get involved. And then today, at the end of the service, and at 1 o'clock online, Sherry's leading a class that's just an introduction to organic disciples. It's about 30, 35 minutes of teaching. And then you can do the survey tool. If you're online, you just do it online. If you're here and you don't like computers and stuff, we have regular paper. You can fill it in with a pencil, and we'll score it for you, and we'll, see, and we'll give you all the resources. So we want to help you wherever you're at to take that next step and get involved and get engaged. And so would you pause with me and would you say this prayer, if, it, if you can say it from your heart, would you say to God, oh God, I want to become more like Jesus. I want to grow in my faith. I want, to, I want to be more like the Savior who gave his life for me. So God, I pray over these eight weeks, I will go deep as a learner, as a student, and let you touch my life. And I pray, oh Jesus, that this change that happens in these next eight weeks will carry me through all the rest of my life until I see Jesus face to face. Make that your prayer. And if you're not yet a believer, would you say, Jesus, if you're real, I want to know about you. If I could follow you and have a relationship with you, open my eyes these next eight weeks to what it means to follow you. And if you're real, Jesus, I want to know you.
Jesus, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Well, today, as we kick off, we're going to talk about three epic questions about growing in Jesus, being a disciple, growing up in Jesus, and also going with Jesus to share his love. That's organic outreach or evangelism. There's three questions that kind of set the the tone for the whole discussion. And if you can get these right, you're going to have a whole new, bigger understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a disciple. So here's the first question. Question number one. How can I know I am growing as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus? How do I know I'm growing up in faith? Now I want you to imagine that somebody you know who you really respect as a Christian comes to you and says to you, hey, are you growing up in your faith? Are you growing as a disciple? What would you say to him? Are you growing as a disciple? Most people probably say something like this. "Uh, Yeah, I think so. I hope hope so. I think I am. But how do do you know? I I don't know. I just, I mean, I love Jesus and I read my Bible sometimes. I go to church. Is there, you know, but a lot of times we don't have a clear picture in our mind of what we mean by growing up in faith. How do I know I'm growing up in faith? We want to help answer that question in a deep and a rich way. And I think there's two things, two big things that will help you understand if you're growing in faith. The first one is your character, your heart, your soul. And you have to look at that first. Before you start looking at things like, do I read my Bible? Do I pray? Do I go to church? Talk about, am I in love with Jesus? Am I walking with Jesus? So, so in Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23, we find the place of the fruit of the Spirit for ongoing growth. The fruit of the Spirit, that if you know Jesus, the Spirit moves in you. And if you walk with him, the Spirit grows in you. The Spirit kind of guides all of your life. So listen to these words from Galatians 5, beginning of verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now here's the picture. Do you understand that you can start doing all the things you're supposed to do to grow as a Christian and still have your heart in the wrong place? You can look really good on the outside and be really bad on the inside. There was a whole group of leaders in the first century that Jesus encountered at different times, kind of bumped heads with. And these leaders, these religious leaders, they knew the Bible better than anybody else. They they read it every day. They studied it every day. They knew how to pray, when to pray, where to pray. They did all the prayers right. They gave their offering the exact amount Every single time. I mean, they followed all the rules, but their hearts were so hard to God. Something wasn't happening on the inside, so they were doing all the outside stuff. So it'd be like this. It'd be the person who says, oh, I study my Bible. I sure do. Way more than you do. Oh, yeah, I study the Bible so I can prove other people wrong. And I can debate them into the ground and and, and kick their spiritual behinds. Woo! Got my Bible. You know, I read my Bible so I can feel arrogant about how spiritual I am. Is that the heart of Jesus? No. You're doing the right thing, but where's the love? Where's the joy? Where's the peace? Where's the gentleness? You get the point? Oh, I pray. There were religious leaders in Jesus. They prayed in the right place at the right time so everyone could see them. And God says, you missed the point. You're supposed to be talking to me, not putting on a show for other people. They did the stuff. They did the religious stuff. They just didn't have their hearts right. And so our starting point needs to be that we would say, God, let your fruit grow in me. Let your spirit be with me so that whatever I do to grow in faith, it doesn't make me arrogant. It doesn't make me in competition with others. It just makes me more like Jesus because that's my desire. So Lord, let your love and your joy and your peace, let the fruit of your spirit, self-control, patience, for you know, all of these things, Lord, let it grow in me. Make that your prayer, that God would grow the fruit of the spirit in you. So, so, that you, so that when you are growing in faith, it doesn't become an act of arrogance or an act of showing off. It becomes a desire to follow Jesus. So, so how do I know I'm growing as a disciple? Well, the fruit of the Spirit's growing in me. My attitude, my, my heart, my soul are in the right place. But there's another part. There are actions. There's spiritual growth. And so we took time about five or six years ago with our children here at Shoreline, with our children's leaders, youth leaders, men's leaders, women's leaders, all of our ministry leaders for about nine months. We studied the Bible to say, what are the things that that show that a Christian is growing up in faith? What are the things that Jesus did and called us to do? And when we do those things, we actually go out to the world and share his love. And we found seven things, seven markers of spiritual growth that we identified, seven ingredients of spiritual growth for our souls, for our lives. 
And, 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 these, and these ingredients are all important. So you'll see up on the screen here, uh, this, this badge that we use around Shoreland. It says, more like Jesus. How do I know I'm becoming more like Jesus? And you see those, those seven kind of little symbols or pictures to kind, of, to kind of lock into our minds the seven markers of spiritual growth. Now, we use these with our children's ministry, our youth ministry, and our adults. And when you see one of these in a, in a bulletin or, a, or on, a, on a website, you can kind of know what we're talking about. So the, the first one is Bible engagement. It's a picture of just kind of the open Bible, or Bible engagement. How do I know I'm growing in my faith? I'm engaging more in the Bible. Today, we're, we're going to be, or next Sunday, they're teaching about Bible engagement, and we'll look at that here, and our youth will look at this, and our children will look at it. But Bible engagement, here, here's what we're going to teach our children. How do I know I'm engaged in the Bible? Well, I'm learning the Bible, I'm loving the Bible, I'm living the Bible. That's what we're going to teach your kids, if you have kids here. How do I know I'm engaging in the Bible? I'm learning the Bible, I'm loving the Bible, I'm living the Bible. Is that growing inside of you? Passionate prayer. How do I know I'm growing in prayer? Am I praying more? Am I praying more with other Christians? Am I praying with people who don't know Jesus? I've asked thousands of non-believers through my years as a Christian, could I pray for you right now? I've had three tell me no. Almost every person I've talked to, even hardcore atheists, if they share a deep pain or a deep joy, and I say, yeah, I know you may not be in the whole prayer thing, but I'd be so honored if I could just say a quick prayer for you. Would that be okay? Almost everyone goes, yeah, sure. I remember the first time I asked my dad to pray when he was, a, when he was still a strong atheist. He said, couldn't hurt. <laughs> he never told me no. And then one day I got to pray with him, with Sherry and him, for him to receive Jesus. But we had prayed, I'll bet you, 70 times before that, before he was a Christian. Passionate prayer grows our prayer life wholehearted worship. How do I know I'm growing up in faith? I'm worshiping God with greater passion, not just in a church service, but through my days. My life becomes an act of worship. Am I growing in worship? And then humble service, the hand reaching to another hand, right? Am I humbly serving others? Why? Because Jesus humbly served. He calls us to serve, and when we serve, it impacts the world. Are you growing in humble service? And joyful generosity. We talked about this with our staff five or six years ago when we said, is this one of the markers of spiritual growth? But you know, there's more passages in the Bible about generosity than there is about almost any other topic. Matter of fact, Doug, you're starting a class on Wednesday nights, this coming Wednesday, about, about growing in generosity. And so, so that's one of the markers. Am I learning to give with generosity, but am I doing it with a joyful heart? Consistent community. God's people together. That part of being a Christian is being part of God's family, part of the body of Christ. Am I growing in my connection with other believers? And then organic outreach. Am I naturally sharing, Jesus, am I shining the light? of Jesus in our dark world. How do I know I'm growing up as a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is growing in me, and the seven markers of spiritual growth are growing in me and leading me out with God's love. Now, I want to give you a picture of two things that I, when, around food. There's a menu and there's a recipe. Okay? There's a menu and there's a recipe. What's the difference between a menu and a recipe? With a menu. You go to a restaurant, they hand you a menu. And what do you get to do when you look at that menu? You get to do what? Order. Order. Choose what you want, right? I mean, a menu, you go, oh, I want this, this. Oh, no, no. Oh, there it is. And you, you choose what you want. And there's some things that are like a menu. But your spiritual growth and the markers of spiritual growth are not a menu that you choose the ones you like. Oh, I like Bible study and I, I, I like Bible study, uh, you know, Bible engagement and passionate prayer. I don't like joyful generosity and I don't like organic outreach. You know, no thanks, right? But those seven things are not, they're not a menu. They're a recipe. And if someone gives you a recipe, you have to put all the ingredients in to get what you want. So I asked Sherry, and she very graciously, strictly for the sermon, I asked her to make her grandmother's famous chocolate chip cookies. Um, it's just a sermon prop. I'm sure when this is over, I'll just toss them out. Uh, but uh, there's no service after this, so if you want to try one afterwards, you can let me know. Or do I have to save these? Do we, are they for a small group tonight? Okay. Um, and so there's a recipe for her, her dad's mom's chocolate chip cookies. And she made it exactly like that recipe says. Now I want you to imagine somebody tried one of these cookies. Oh, I love it. Matter of fact, somebody did that after the first service, somebody did have one of these. And she said, oh my gosh, it was just amazing. And so what if somebody said to me, can I have the recipe? Right? If you go to a restaurant and say, can I have a menu, they'll give it to you. If you say, can I have all your recipes, what are they going to say? No, <laughs> right? But if, somebody, if, if, you gave, if Sherry gave you the recipe to, to her grandma's chocolate chip cookies, and then you made them, and you called me a couple days later, and you said, Pastor Kevin, you talked about how delicious those were. I made those cookies. They're terrible. I didn't like it at all. I said, seriously? No, I, it was terrible. I said, well, tell me how you made it. Well, 
I started cooking and I realized I didn't have any chocolate chips. But I had some of that chocolate, cooking chocolate, you know, that's really bitter, you know. And I just broke up some pieces of that and threw it in there. And, and I, did, I ran out of sugar, so the, the part, I, I only had half of the amount of sugar, but I just put salt in for the rest of it because it looks the same, <laughs> right? And I didn't have any, these are fresh walnuts in here. I didn't have any walnuts, so I used, shave, I used shaved almonds. And I said, and I can tell, then you didn't get to try what? Her grandma's chocolate chip. You, didn't, you, had, you had something, but you didn't have this because you didn't use all the right ingredients. Well, that's our spiritual journey. These markers of maturity that we're going to look at over the next seven weeks, they're not optional. They're all part of the recipe. And if you want to, if you want to have a spiritual life where you just go, oh, that's delicious, that's wonderful, that's the way it's meant to be, follow God's recipe. And that's why we want you to do that self-assessment tool. Because when you do the self-assessment tool, you're going to identify some areas of the markers that you're really strong, but you're going to identify a couple that you're going to go, oh, I don't have much of that ingredient in there. Maybe that's why my spiritual life isn't as dynamic as it should be. And we're going to give you tools and ways to grow each of those things so that you can have that recipe that brings life and joy. And so, you know, how, do I, how do I know I'm growing up in faith? Number one, the fruit of the Spirit is growing in me. And number two, I'm growing in Bible engagement, passionate prayer, wholehearted worship, these seven areas. I'm, I'm consistently growing. And when that happens, it unleashes joy and meaning and purpose in your life. That's question number one. Question number two. Is discipleship bigger than my relationship with Jesus? Is being a disciple more than just, I read my Bible, I pray, I love Jesus, Jesus loves me. Is discipleship more than, is it bigger than just my relationship with Jesus? And here's the answer in one word. Yes. It's way bigger than that. There's more going on in discipleship than just my relationship with Jesus. And sometimes we live a certain way, we're taught a certain way, so we kind of think, well, I, I got it. I, if somebody says, well, are you growing as a Christian? You go, oh, nailed it, got it. Got it. I'm, I'm doing it, man. I'm living as a Christian. Are you sure you got the whole picture? And ha have any of you seen the memes, the, the, meme, the pictures of nailed it, where, where people are trying to duplicate something and it didn't turn out quite the way they thought it would? And the line is, nailed it, but the point is, no, you didn't. Well, if you're not familiar with that, let me make you familiar, okay? Uh, suppose a big burly guy goes into a tattoo parlor. And he's got this picture of, of like a, a Pegasus, a flying horse. He says, I want this tattoo on my right shoulder. He goes in there. The tattoo artist is working for hours and hours and hours. He can't see what's going on, but this is what's going on behind his shoulder. You see what he, the drawing he has there, right? And you see what the tattoo artist, and the, and, and the guy says, how's it look? And the tattoo artist says, nailed it. But guess what? Not so much, right? Not so much. That could be our spiritual life. I got it all figured out, but, but do we? Here's another one. Sometimes on Instagram, people will post things. Here's a wonderful idea for you to make a, your own Christmas card. You got a newborn baby. and Can you duplicate this in your own, with your own newborn? Here's a picture of somebody who tried to duplicate it. Right, here it is. Take a look at the two pictures together. <laughs> and two words. Nailed it, right? Well, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure, right? Uh, suppose, suppose you find a nice ice cream treat for your kids and you go, oh, these are expensive. I'll make it myself. Here's the, here's the store button. <laughs> Nailed it. That's just going to scare the kid. That's just going to scare the kid, right? Nailed, okay. And then this is a great, I love this one. There's, I guess there's a baking show called Nailed It where they kind of have fun with this. But here's an example of somebody making a cake out of cupcakes and then the effort somebody else made to match it. And this is just a little scary, but here's, here's the two, two cupcake cakes. Can you guess which of those two is the one that uh, was the model and which one was? It's just a little creepy, right? And my, one last one, and this was my favorite one. Some little kid wanted their, their uh, parents to make them a costume so they could be Aquaman for, uh, for Halloween. Aquaman. So I want you, when you see what, this is so creative, so beautiful, so nailed it, but so I'm not sure. Uh, because look at what kind of food, foods are used to make it. So here's the outfit. All right. The, the chest armor looks like it's the skins of a pineapple. The, 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 the washboard abs, corn on the cob. <laughs> so good you could eat them, right? Uh, but then, and, and then the arm, it just, and you go, well, two words. What is it? Nailed. Nailed it, right? Well, maybe not. Now, here's what I want you to understand. You may look at your spiritual life. Okay, we can make Aquaman go away. Thank you. You, you may look at your spiritual life, and you, you might go, Nay, I got it. I nailed it. I'm living the life for Jesus. But maybe there's more. Maybe there's more to the picture. Maybe you can go, man, there's, there's something more beautiful, so wonderful that I, I don't even imagine it right now.
And so I want to suggest to you that most Christians see discipleship as this. It's me and Jesus, and I'm becoming more like Jesus. I'm loving him more, I'm praying more, I'm reading his word, I'm following him, but it's me and Jesus, Jesus and me. The challenge is that if you think that's it and you go, I nailed it, you don't recognize the bigness of discipleship. Because discipleship always actually has four generations of people involved. It's not just me and Jesus, it's bigger than that. There's always four generations in discipleship. Listen to these words from 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 2. This is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to Timothy. Timothy is a pastor at a church in the city of Ephesus. He's a young pastor. Paul is discipling him, mentoring him, taking his hand and helping him grow spiritually. But listen to what Paul says and look for the four generations in this passage. Paul says to Timothy, you then, my son, he's like a spiritual son to him, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so then he says, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, Paul says, the things that I've said, the things that I've taught you, right, entrust to reliable people, you teach them, who will also be qualified to do what? Teach others. Do you see the four generations? Paul is saying, Timothy, I'm taking your hand. I'm helping you grow as a pastor, as a follower of Jesus. I'm, I'm discipling you, helping you follow Jesus more effectively. So Paul is pointing to Timothy's life. He says, now, but Timothy, I've taught you these things. So grow in your faith. You take care of your own spiritual growth. That's important. But Timothy, you look for reliable people who you can take their hand and help them grow spiritually. So now, Timothy, you're not just receiving from me. You're not just tending to your own spiritual growth. You're actually helping other people grow. But Timothy, it doesn't stop there. You pour to reliable people who will be able to do what? Teach others. How many generations? Paul, Timothy, reliable people, and you teach others. Four generations. Do you get it? Now, if you look at your own life, you can probably recognize that that, that has hopefully happened. That people have taken your hand spiritually, that you've taken people's hands spiritually, but we've got to be intentional. If you say, well, my spiritual growth, I've nailed it. My discipleship, I've nailed it. Maybe there's more to following Jesus than we understand. Maybe there's a bigger, more beautiful picture. In my life, before I became a Christian, this guy, Doug Drainville, I was 15, almost 16, between my sophomore and junior year of high school, and this college guy, he was probably 19 at the time. He was a pretty new Christian. This guy, Doug, he took my hand, and he started to help me learn about Jesus. Before I became a Christian, he was helping me come towards Jesus. When I became a Christian for the next couple of years, he kept taking my hand and helping me grow. So that top person there, that's Doug Drainville, and he's taking my hand. I'm the second person. He's helping me grow spiritually, but he gives me a Bible and says, now you feed yourself spiritually. Read the Bible, pray, and I'm... And I'm tending to my own spiritual growth. So I've got Doug helping me. I'm tending my own spiritual growth. And then through the years, I've had the privilege of taking the hand of many different people, people who are younger in faith, and helping them grow in faith. So there's a guy, Adam Barr. He pastors a church called Inheritance Church in, in, in Grand Rapids area in Michigan. And Adam, years ago, I took his hand and started to help him. He was just finishing college, thinking about becoming a pastor. And I've been for years. He would tell you right now, I still invest in his life. But I'd help him grow along spiritually. I'd encourage him. I'd challenge him. And he has four sons. He's taking their hands. He's helping them. They actually help lead the church with him. They're on the worship team. Great, gifted young guys. That's an example. Sherry's life. Her parents, Sherwin and Joan Vleen, loved Jesus. They took Sherry's hand every day of her life growing up. They prayed with her. They taught her the Bible. They took her hand. They took her to church. They took her hand and helped her grow. And then Sherry has taken her own spiritual growth seriously. She reads the Bible. She prays. She goes to church. She's growing in faith. But Sherry has taken the hands of many younger women through the years and helped them grow spiritually. There's a woman right now named Kaylee, Kaylee Deal. Kaylee's on staff at Shoreline. And if you said to Kaylee, Kaylee, who spiritually mentors you and helps you grow, who disciples you? She'd say Sherry Harney. For the last two years, I think Sherry's been formally doing that with her and helping her grow in faith. And right now, Kaylee is on the way back from Hume Lake with our high school kids because she works with our young people in the church and she's taken the hands of a bunch of different younger women. Some of them you know because they're your daughters or granddaughters. And Kaylee's helping them grow spiritually and helping them follow Jesus. And six of those young people who were at Hume Lake the last couple of days put their faith in Jesus for the first time last night, right? And, and I will say this, praise God, amen. If one of those young women that Kaylee is helping along put her faith in Jesus or is growing in faith, you know who helped her grow? Sherwin and Joan Vleem, who poured into Sherry, who takes the hand of Kaylee, who takes the hand of these young women, and someday they'll take the hand of somebody else and help them come. That's, from, from, from the beginning of time in the church, that's how it works. So are you growing as a disciple? Here's how you know if you're growing as a disciple. You look at your hands, you go, okay, do I have people holding my hand helping me grow? I got two pastors right now 
who, who Carl Overbeek and Paul Cedar, they're both retired pastors, who helped me grow spiritually. I'm a grandpa now. And I've asked these men, will you help me grow spiritually? Will you keep me accountable? Will you challenge me to follow Jesus more? Why? Because I still need it, and I'm your pastor. So they're helping me. And I have people, I'm like, that, that's the journey. Do you have people that are helping you grow spiritually and people that you are helping grow spiritually and teaching them to help someone else? Because that's the journey of Jesus. It's always four generations. And that brings glory to God and joy to him. And so even in the Old Testament, this was the model. Listen to these words from Psalm 78, verses five through seven. If you're a note taker, write that down. Psalm 78, five through seven. And it's talking about the generations, how generation impacts the next generation. He decreed statutes for Jacob. This is God Almighty. Decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, meaning God, he, God spoke to his people. He gave them a direction of how to live, which he commanded our ancestors to what? Teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and then they in turn will tell their children. Get it? This generation tells their children, they tell their children they're not yet born, and those not yet born children will tell their, their children. It's generation by generation by generation. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Is discipleship more than just me and Jesus? Yeah. It's a journey of life to life. And when you take someone's hand and help them grow closer to Jesus, you're discipling them. You're helping them move closer to Jesus. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, oh, let's, question number three, question number three. What is the relationship between discipleship and evangelism? Okay, so, so we, we, we're talking, discipleship is bigger than we think, but how do discipleship growing in Jesus and evangelism going with Jesus into the world, how do they connect to each other? How do they relate to each other? In a lot of churches, they're seen as sort of separate things. I've heard pastors say things like this. Well, we're more of a discipleship church. We don't really do the whole outreach thing. I know pastors have been like, well, we're about evangelism, but they don't do very much discipleship. But discipleship and evangelism, growing in Jesus and going with Jesus, they're connected. Listen to these words from Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. And this is Jesus, in this passage, Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen from the dead. He's been appearing for 40 days, and he's about to ascend to heaven. And this is one of the last things Jesus says. Verse 19 of Matthew 28. Jesus says, the resurrected Christ, who's about to ascend to heaven, says, therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations. Take people's hands and help them grow towards Jesus in faith and walk with him. You go, therefore, and make disciples of who? All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go make disciples of all nations. Now, is that evangelism? Helping people come to Jesus or discipleship? Helping people walk with Jesus? Well, it's both. Because he says baptizing them. You're reaching people that don't know Jesus. You're helping them walk towards Jesus. But then you're also helping them grow in their faith in Jesus. Now, here's a diagram we created uh, through Organic Outreach International, which is the ministry of Shoreline Church. Uh, this diagram is just a picture of a person on their journey. And you see on the left is evangelism, the right is discipleship. And you see up above, minus 20 to plus 20. So minus 20 would be a hardcore atheist, hates God, hates the church. If you're a Christian, stays away from you, uh, argues against your faith constantly. That's a hard, hardcore. And then, you know, you move across to the cross where someone finally becomes a Christian, and then they're growing in their journey. Now, my dad, when I became a Christian, my dad was probably a minus 15. He wasn't angry, hostile, but he was a strong atheist, an intellectual atheist. I watched my dad kind of take steps toward Jesus to a minus 10, to a minus 5, to a minus 1. Sherry and I got to be with my dad when he prayed to receive Jesus and got to begin this journey of spiritual growth. A month after he became a Christian, he went to be with Jesus. But, but that journey from minus 15 to probably plus 2 or 3, now he's with Jesus and everything makes sense, but, but, now, but, but that journey took over 40 years. But each step my dad took closer to Jesus was a step of becoming more like Jesus, knowing more about Jesus than becoming his follower and then starting to grow in that faith. And so, so here's, here's the thing. The relationship of discipleship and evangelism. Some people see them as very separate. Let me give you a three statements. And this is kind of like a, a little saying I came up with to clarify it in my mind and hopefully clarify it in other people's minds. Evangelism, sharing Jesus, and discipleship, growing in Jesus, are not enemies. They're not rivals, they shouldn't be separate things in our thinking. Well, there's discipleship and then there's evangelism. And I like discipleship growing in Jesus. I don't like evangelism going to talk about Jesus. Ah, I like this one. They should, they're not enemies. They're not at conflict with each other. 
Evangelism and discipleship are not just friends. They're not just kind of like pals who hang out. No, yeah, we get along. We're okay. You know, we have fun together. No. But evangelism and discipleship are marriage partners. They're bound together. And what God brings together, no one should tear apart. See, if you're following Jesus, you're growing in faith. If you're following Jesus, you go where he goes. And he goes to the lost and the broken. He goes to the forgotten. He goes to the lost sheep. You can't be a Christian and not be growing to be more like him. And if you're going to be more like him, guess what? You're going where he goes. So in our church, we're going to talk a lot about discipleship, growing in Jesus, evangelism, going with Jesus to share his love with the world. Those go hand in hand. And do you understand that the more you do evangelism as a church, the more you have to do discipleship because there's new believers. And the more you do discipleship and people grow closer to Jesus and follow him, the more you can do evangelism because they're going to share their faith. And it just builds on itself. The beauty of that is what the church should be. And so every time we help another person take a next step closer to Jesus, this is discipleship. If you say, well, I don't, I don't really, I don't know if I can disciple people. Can you take someone's hand and help them become more like Jesus? Grandparents, parents, can you teach your grandkids or your kids how to pray? Can you pray with them and for them? That's discipleship. You're helping them become more like Jesus. Can you teach the word of God to somebody? who's younger in faith, leading a small group. You're helping people grow closer to Jesus. Every one of our people right now that's not in the worship center because they're off in our children's department, pouring into your kids and your grandkids. They are discipling, they're mentoring, they're helping them become more like Jesus. We can all take someone's hand and let them help us. We can all take someone else's hand and help them grow and we can teach them how to do what we're doing because it's not that complicated. This is how Christians are supposed to live. And this is what we call a journey of a lifetime. This is a lifelong journey of becoming more and more like Jesus. And so I want to give you a challenge. And this is, this is kind of a first big challenge. And that is this, to take the spiritual growth self-assessment. And if you've already done it, take it again because we, re, we refined it and made it better than it was a couple of years ago. We've really worked hard on this to make it strong. And so what's the, what is the spiritual growth self-assessment and how will it help me grow in my faith? Uh, it's something we created here at Shoreline. It's 35 questions about your own spiritual journey. And all you do is you can do it online or you can do it in a hard copy. As a matter of fact, Sherry's gonna be doing a class right after the service. For anybody who wants to learn more about what we're talking about, there's gonna be a 35-minute class of her teaching. And then uh, just on what does it mean to be an organic disciple? And then after that, if you want to take the test, you know, if you say, I don't really like the whole computer thing, but I'd like to just have a sheet of paper and fill in the bubbles, she'll do that with you. If you go to her time after 35 minutes, she'll say, okay, if you can do the, you know, do the, the self-assessment online, you're dismissed. Those that want to do it with, you know, on paper right here, we want to make sure everyone can do this, that nobody feels left out, okay? But here's what it looks like if you go online. If you go on Shoreline's website, on the front page, there's a place that says self-assessment. Click on it, boom, this is what you get. It's that easy. And all you do is you read the first question. When people I know have questions about life or other challenges, I find myself searching the Bible to help them find answers that will help them navigate life's tough times. And then you just mark one of these bubbles. Never true of me. Rarely true of me. Occasionally true of me. Often true of me. Always true of me. And you just mark, you just click on one, or if you do it with share, you fill in the bubble. And then you go to the next question. I make attending worship with God's people a high priority and I am, in, in, I am in gathered worship at least three or four Sundays each month. Online or here, I'm in, gather, I'm in worship with God's people. Never true of me, rarely true of me. And you just you do this. When you finish all 35 of them at the bottom, if you want to meet with someone one-on-one, you click the, button, the little spot that says, I'd like to meet with someone one-on-one. And we'll meet with you and we'll have a conversation. We'll help you design your next steps of spiritual growth. If you're like, I can, I'm good, I'll do this on my own. Then don't mark that button and you click finish. And in about two seconds, boom, you have an email in your email box that has a scale on all seven areas of where you are. And if you click on the links, there's different ways, there's ways to grow, like 15 to 30 ways to grow in each area. And you can design your own pathway. So I don't know how to make it any easier. <laughs> um, we're making that, we created this, we made it available for any church anywhere in the world for free. We have it on the organic outreach uh, website also. Use our website for, for Shoreline Church people. But we actually are trying to get this available in seven different languages and more than that to give it away to the church for free. We want to see people take their next steps of spiritual growth. So if you're excited about that, open to that, then take that next step. And for all of us, these next seven weeks, have your heart open because Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. We want to become more like you. We want to grow in spiritual maturity. More and more to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus alive in us. 
So Lord, we say, we take the challenge, we're open, and Lord, these next eight weeks, let us fully engage and see you grow in us new and beautiful things. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Before I have you stand and send you off with a word of blessing, before you log off at home there, stay with me for just one minute. A couple invitations. Number one, if you need prayer and you're online, just text your prayer to the email or call the number. We'll pray with you there. If you're on campus, come up front here with our prayer teams and let us pray with you if you're outdoors. Come on in for prayer with us in here. If you're new at Shoreline, we welcome you if you're online for the first time. Just text the word welcome to the number you see there and we will follow up with you and reach out to you. If you're on campus, go by the Connection Center and just tell them you're new and they'll give you a little gift bag and thank you for coming and answer your questions. If you want to take a next step in spiritual growth, uh, go to the class. Sherry's already had it's upstairs here in the garden room, and she's starting that in about five minutes. If you've got some time and you want to jump into that, jump in with her online. We have an online class at 1 o'clock today, and Sherry will be teaching the same stuff live stream online. So she's teaching it three times today. So 1 o'clock online if you're at home. And then finally... We want to challenge you to read the book, and so if you want the book, go by the Connection Center right now and pick one up. If you're at home and you want one, come in during the week, and you can get one, pay for it or get one for free, or go online and you can get the audio book that Sherry and I read, or you can get the electric book, or you can buy a copy online. But we hope you jump in there. If you're able to, stand with us, and let me send you off with a different kind of blessing today. It's more of a challenge blessing, all right? But I believe it'll bless you. As you go from this place... Hear God's invitation to follow Jesus more closely, to become more like Jesus. May you love him more and walk more closely with him so then you can be filled with the spirit and walk with him into this world and share his love everywhere you go. God bless you. Have a great week. And we're back next week on week two of Organic Disciples. God bless you. Have a great week.